I am unashamed. What about you? So we're back with uh, Unashamed. We have a rare uh, Sunday recording today. Jason's got some. Uh, he's got some issues. Some. Uh, Production issues for his show this week, so we're recording hard, on Sunday. It's hard to juggle duck hunting, podcasts, <laughs> and TV filming That's right. simultaneously. That's exactly right. So. But I noticed, uh, I'm noticing Zach, those of you that are watching the podcast, those of you that watch it uh, on YouTube or wherever you watch it, Zach is all spruced up. Oh, he looks 10 years younger. Fancy pants. So I think he just came from the gathering. Yeah. Did church. you preach this I, morning, Zach? Did. did you? It's the, it's the first day of I the did week. not preach this. I did not preach this morning, but I did. Jill and I spoke at a marriage retreat this weekend. So mm. there was that. And, well, I, and when I, get, I got my hair that? cut for that. Oh. That's why I got, yeah. And I told the guy, I said, I want you to start with a zero and then kind of work your way up. Well, he just started with a zero and then just went all the way up. So I've got like a, I think in the business, they call it a high and tight. <laughs> they took it all off. Well, I was looking for this verse that I can't find because I want to keep you from undergoing any kind of legalistic tendencies. But I remember I passed it somewhere in Samuel where it says, mm-hmm. man looks at the outward appearances. It's First Samuel 16. There it is. The Lord said to Samuel or to Zach, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Oh, wow. <laughs> Welcome to the show, I, Zach. I, I, are, you, are you calling me to repentance for my haircut? I mean, is that what this is? No, it's, beca- it's because I came from a legacy in a family that the two things you don't do is cut hair or cut grass. <laughs> <laughs> and I do both. <laughs> Those are the two uh, no-nos of our civilization. I've let, y'all, I've let you down. I'm, I'm, As I'm, uh, well, I was yeah, shocked I'm when anomaly. I saw you. I thought it was one of your sons or something making a guest appearance. He's fancy. So, no, it's me. So, Zach, what was the gist of your marriage? Uh, it, was it like a... Several uh, talks? Did you have like a, several different sessions? Or? No, we just spoke one time. Jill and I spoke on it, um, initiating and stewarding family revival. Um, it was at a, a, another church in town um, that a friend of ours is a pastor at. And so we were asked just to come over. And, you know, we have five kids. And I, I guess that gives you some kind of legitimacy when you have uh, as many as we've had. Um, yep. So, yeah, it, it was interesting, though. And the guy that spoke before us was a, a therapist, a marriage and family therapist at Seacoast Church. Um, and he talked about intimacy. So a lot of our stuff was really just echoing what he said. We did a whole lot out of Genesis 1 through 3. Yep. Um, just about uncovering shame, confession, repentance. So, Zach, I know you've got some good stuff you do on kind of the fig leaf from uh, from Genesis Tell us about that. That's that's good. Yeah, I got actually. You know, it's funny. Jill wrote this. I, I, this is not a shameless plug, by the way, because people. I, I did see someone in the comments accuse me of shameless plugs, and I think that that's because <laughs> Jace keeps saying that I'm doing that, and so now people. I don't know are where starting, we got that idea. Me and this all, guy hey, on the internet. My plugs, where do we? Maybe it's the Jace says that calls. every podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I call it like if I say, I say it. anything. Jay's like, oh, here we go. Uh, All right, Jill well, give published us, a book. Give us your plug. We'll just take out the word. I, it's not, I'm not going to get the plug. I was just going to say, I did. I did write a manuscript that I, I haven't published called the Fig Leaf Project, and it's and it was really just a summation of ten years of of ministry, particularly uh, mostly college ministry, and so it's like stories attached to people who are coming out of hiding. Because in Genesis 3, when they covered up with fig leaves, that's a metaphor, um, you know, really, for, it, it's, it's a metaphor for hiding. And we, we have our own fig leaves when we hide from God. So, you know, if you're going to have intimacy in a marriage, um, there has to be a degree of openness. And um, Romans 5 is one of my favorite passages that kind of talks about this, that, that when you're uncovered before God, he doesn't look at you and say you're great. He looks at you and says, you're an enemy. But that's the good news is, is that he says, while you were still enemies, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, still sinners, that Christ died for the ungodly. So that was pretty much the crux of our talk. And uh, in between and you're that. So, and you're G- so right, Zach. And it's, it's, you and I have discussed this many times. It sets the heart of relationship issues. And, and I'm glad we brought it up because there's so many 
people that are listening to our podcast that are struggling in their marriage, it starts with that idea of allowing yourself to be that vulnerable and open to God first, and then it can open up to your spouse. But if you don't get that directional thing right first, that's where the problems are, and people can't figure that out. It's got you got to get the first things first, and then then the relationship works out the way it's supposed to. Yeah, it's a whole lot less about skill sets, and uh, you know, t- tr- uh, typically with marital counseling and and those things, it's a, it's about let me give you a set of skills that you can learn and implement, which is not bad. But I think that if you're really going to have a wonderful marriage, it's got to be on a deeper level. It's got to be more about um, connecting and being present. You know, but particularly in, in, in your brokenness and uh, and there's a bond that's the form there that's virtually unbreakable. But I, when that was all done in between. Jace called me a few times. Uh, I saw the missed calls. So I tried to get back with Jace and we did have a bit of an emergency this weekend, Jace. Did we? Emergency? I'm not real sure what you're referring to. I've slept <laughs> twice since. <laughs> did we have an emergency? I mean, you call when you, but you oh. don't, I mean, if you call me, like yeah, I, I, I t- on a on a Saturday, and it was di- I think yeah. you were in a duck line, which is what that's what kind of cued me something. There's an urgency here. Well, right. it was it was dear, it was in the it morning. Was, yeah, I did call you from the duck blind, and uh, I do remember it because it involved our daughters, who are actually, I guess we can say this, they're rooming together Room, roommates and, in college. Uh, in college right? yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, which is awesome how family works. I mean, it's. It's great. But when my daughter called me, I was like, I mean, why would she be called? What's wrong? And uh, she was like, Dad, I need a favor. I was like, all right. And she said, I'm going on a trip to, uh, I want to go to a trip out of the country, help some kids. And she went through it in uh, in Nicaragua. And we want to use your social media to raise some money. So I said, well, Mia, I haven't been on my social media in about four years. <laughs> I'll have to check with the rest of our family and see how that's going. <laughs> so I called Zach. Cause so I, said, the, I thought you were going to say the first person you called was dad to see. <laughs> yeah. well, that's the reason to I get advice Zach. To get advice on what to do about social media. Yeah, so yeah, I'd plow right into that. <laughs> <laughs> so I ch- and look, not to say that there are a few. There's been a few exceptions where I actually, you know, it was Commented. me. It was me on the social media. But I mean, just overall, in general, it's it's people in my family who I trust, and we we kind of do it together. So yeah. I'm aware of it. I'm just not actively pushing buttons at all times. But so I called Zach because your daughter was one of the ones she named on the trip, and I was like, Zach, how do you want to handle this? Because Zach knows people. Well, it's just yeah. his world. He is a social media, whatever that is. Yeah. Okay, what well, yeah, because we're excited. I mean, we're excited, though. I was just kind of a man, you know. Uh, it's, it is it is a blessing to have your kids want to raise money for, for a group of students to go on a mission trip. I think that's, yeah. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's the first thing we discussed. I said, look, I really have a blessing and a good problem. Our two daughters want to go on a mission trip. And do mission work. And they want to raise some money. And she's calling me saying, will you help us? I thought, Zach, of all the things that our daughters can That's be right. calling and discussing, I got this pretty well at the top of the list. I mean, there are some people getting a call saying, hey, Dad, I'm in jail. Well, right. You know, can yeah. you can you well, come bail thought, me out? You know what? The first thing I thought about was I remember a story of another uh, two cousins that lived together in college and <laughs> and <laughs> in this family yeah. and they were not going on mission trips. No, so they were not. I, well, I this was is, like, man, the Lord, the Lord this, is good. This he, is during spring redeeming, break. He's redeeming thing. I think it's a good, it's good if you're, if your college age kids on spring break are trying to go on a mission trip. So it's interesting, Jay. So but I didn't know you guys were having calls so you call me, which rarely happens unless we're working on some kind of schedule for the podcast. Actually, you call Lisa and you said, does Al know his phone is at some place? Oh, let's talk about this. <laughs> no, wait a minute, Al. You've got this story completely wrong. So, because you got to remember, the reason I'm calling Zach in a duck blind is because I, and the reason we're meeting on Sunday is I have these three things just intersecting 
really four things that we one of them is big that I have a great announcement. We got a big announcement coming later. Big, big announcement coming later. So all these things are intersecting while my wife is out of the country. <laughs> yeah. so I'm a bachelor here and I have no one, my, you know, my my partner, my best friend and my Rolodex and all the information that I need, she's not here. So it's just, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So for the TV show, my partner, uh, Mr. Murray Crow, he had something that he wanted to discuss with you about. And so I, I can't even remember what it was, but he said, can you send me Al's phone number? I've misplaced it. I guess he had it. and he So I, I, I sent it to him. Well, it wasn't two minutes later, he calls me and he says, hey, that number you gave me for Al is a grocery store in Alabama. <laughs> and I said, do what? <laughs> and so I thought, what am I doing with a grocery store in Alabama? Because I figured, because I, I, when he said Alabama, I thought, Al, Alabama. I must have, I must have stopped at a grocery store somewhere. Had a conversation <laughs> and put that number in my phone for some reason. <laughs> well, when I run through my phone while I'm talking on it, I'm like, I'm not seeing a grocery store from Alabama on here. So I was like, read back the number that I gave you. Well, he read it back. I looked at Al's number because we don't know the numbers now. Nobody knows a number. Yeah. No. They ask me yeah, yeah. at least once a week, what's your phone number? And I say, I have no idea. And then they look at me like I'm, you know, just incapable of having any intellect in my mind. You don't know your phone number? No. Oh, we remember the tractor supply store. Yeah. Someone else has your warranty now. Yeah, they do. It. So, uh, so, so then it hit me. Well, Al must have left his phone at a grocery store. And he said, well, then Murray was in a rush because I wasn't paying any attention to what he said. And he's like, <laughs> no, they told the grocery store told uh, me to get a hold to Al and tell them that I have that they have his phone. Because the only way they could answer it is if somebody called directly because they can't get into a they phone. They can't get in the it's phone. They went through out, right. So I was like, well, why are you calling yeah. me? He's like, well, you need to call Lisa. Or I was like, oh, yeah, good thinking, Murray. I mean, I was. That's pretty. why he's the brains of your outfit. Yep. So I called Lisa and I was like, hey, uh, where's Al? And she's like, he's here. And I was like, well, his phone is not. Evidently, <laughs> did he go grocery shopping today? She's like, yeah. And then she was like, uh, Al, you left your phone at the grocery store. <laughs> and you, she said, no, he's looking around for it right now. I was like, save him from looking. It's there. They're answering his calls right now That's and right. running his life. <laughs> yeah. so I'll let you pick up from there. Well, so so I left it in the car. It was interesting. So I come in there. So we have people over. We're, we're having dinner when all this is happening. So I don't go immediately. And I go in the store, I walk in, I, and nobody's at customer service because it's, it's 10 o'clock at night when finally my company left. So I said, is there anybody at customer service? She said, well, that's me. I said, I think you guys have my phone. And she said, well, what does it look like? I said, oh, boy, D do people come in here asking for lost phones all the time? Because I was like, what does it look like? It looks like a cell phone that I left in, a, in my cart. And she said, well, how do I, how do I know it's yours? I said, because I'm missing it. <laughs> and you answered it. <laughs> I don't have it. And I don't She was it. giving you interrogation. She, she was. She was. And phone. I was like, I, I, has anybody else said they were missing them? And a they phone? wonder why I've never fooled with a <laughs> cell phone. Which proves, Phil, your point. These people, these people, all people, they treat phones like it's a part of the family. They do. I mean, this yeah. is like we have a kidnap situation <laughs> or right. that we're trying to go through. Or, I mean, he says he lost it. But who would lose their phone? That's right. I mean, you would walk out and say, oh, wait a minute. I'm missing a finger. That's right. And you'd say, yeah. I need to go get that. Because I wasn't that upset about it. Hang on, let's, let's take a break. So I got a question for y'all. Is it weird to give underwear on Valentine's Day? Yep. To me, it would be weird to give it any day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it is. It's weird to give bad underwear on Valentine's oh, Day. Oh, okay. All but right. if you give Tommy John underwear, 
then you've, you're given a good gift. Tommy John, we've been a fan for a long time. I've been a Tommy John fan long before they were sponsors of our podcast. Fantastic. Uh, they're the best at comfort innovation. They got soft tri-blend micro modal fabrics. Have you ever heard of such days? They give it a four-way stretch. It helps you feel the love yeah. all year long. Uh, over 20 million pairs have been sold, so obviously people love it. So this Valentine's season, you got to try it. There's no risk. Uh, every gift is backed by Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free guarantee. So you, you have nothing to lose by trying it. You're going to love them. We all wear them. Our wives wear them. They love them as well. You get 20% off your first purchase if you go to TommyJohn.com slash Phil right now for Valentine's Day. So TommyJohn.com slash Phil, 20% off. TommyJohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details. So I wasn't actually that upset about it. It was kind of nice because then I got to thinking, man, no wonder I had such a nice dinner Oh, it like, frees you up. Oh, there was like nothing going on. I do it I do it once a month, no matter what. I'll go three or four days and just... So here's the irony of it. I'll get my phone. She finally says, okay, this is your phone. And I opened it. I said, look, here's my phone. I can open it. And so I go home. I figured it was too late to call Murray by the time all this transpired. So I call Murray the next morning. He doesn't answer. <laughs> so, so I never found out what he wanted. So all that happened. So we'll probably have to do that again. Yeah, we'll have to do the whole thing again. So anyway, Zach, so tell us what have you, I mean, was that it? We were talking about our daughters. We were just kind of giddy about that. Well, we're going to figure out something. I don't, yeah. So I have to talk to your daughter and see well, what I, the. I thought you had already done that and it's been a couple well, of days. I the, well, I had the, I had the conference the, that I spoke at and then. Okay, so you're giving Church. me excuses. Maybe we should talk about so. this after the podcast. Are we having a meeting? Anyway, yeah, we just, well, I, we were just so saying. When do we? I know this should sound crazy. I'm listening yeah. to y'all talk. When do we work in a, a, a lesson on the Apostle Peter? <laughs> right now. <Okay. laughs> I just want that. Good point, Phil. Good so point. So are you saying, Dad, you're ready to move on into the meat of the matter? Well, y'all's life, y'all, y'all can get hectic in a, in a heartbeat. <laughs> well, while you're well, sitting down here down the side of the river, you see what's happening around the around the world. Right, I'll tell you this, Phil. Well, the hunt for Miss K's phone <laughs> is daily. Well, let me let me I mean, move. Let me the second Ms. pocket Ms. on the door going into the bathroom, if you look at the second pocket on that green colored, it's down. So Dan goes around, you know, and he's he's trying to call it, you know. Bzz, bzz. Some of them are buzzing. Some of them make strange little sounds. You know, I did it yesterday. Some of them too high pitched for my ears. I did this thing yesterday. You're going from room to room, and all of a sudden they said, "Good night." We got it under under the bed on the left hand side. It's up in there. They, you know where mine was yesterday. <laughs> I, I, it could be. Everybody There's was no calling. telling. We were calling my phone. We almost had like a, a switchboard of everybody calling, and they would take turns. When one would finish, the next guy would ring with all my buddies. And it was in my waders. I'd already taken them off and hung them up. But they, and so you would think that the phone would fall out. But, it didn't. but just the way when the waders, even though they were hanging down, it just caught itself without falling to the ground. And it was, I heard those waders buzzing because I had it on buzz because we were duck hunting. And I was like, how would I have ever known that? So I was going to do the it's segue. It's time consuming just to find them. I was going to do the segue into Peter. So, because I think we left off somewhere around, he's given us new birth yep. into a living hope. That's and verse of three. all the analogies he could use, and this analogy is frequent, especially in the New Testament, but in the gospel, you know, Jesus, even when he told Nicodemus, you know, unless you're born again. But here we have new birth. So my breaking news was we had Big a announcement. We had a new birth. I am now the proud grandfather of a son. Of a grandson. So uh and they they named him in the line and legacy of Silas, which came from Uncle Silas. Fourth naming generation. Me because you were, you know, in a transitional period in your life there, Phil. I think you said, what do you want me to do about it? So Cy si named me after him. I named my son in the same vein. He Cyrus. asked what we were going to call you, and I was baiting the trot line, 
Yeah. And, I, and I holler, I was hollering at him. From the river. I said, name him after you. Yeah. He said, really? I said, yep. I said, go tell her that. But my point he was you were baiting with... the trot line where you probably should have been somewhere around the hospital. But, I, you know, I was, I digress. But uh, they tell me the birth with your your granddaughter, your your. So I had a granddaughter. Now I have a grandson. Yeah, the so. birth, the birth with the granddaughter was quick and easy. Yeah, we were all getting ready to go, and they said one minute later it's over. Yeah, which is good for her. Roll in one minute, bam. And hit the first name is after her father. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, which is so. a good legacy. Yeah. Well, congratulations, yeah, so awesome. Jason. There's we're nothing all... quite like it. It's a it's a blessing. I mean, there's you know I had two granddaughters for many years, and then it was a while before I got the grandson. But there is something special about that to me, and yeah, the, and they named moment. him after me too. So it was, you know, kind of a moment. You're kind of overwhelmed. You start thinking about it is legacy and passing on to the next generation. Which, well, we were talking about the our daughters. I mean, I mean, it's special when they realize that they're adopted of our ultimate heavenly Father. Because to me, I mean, without us being together, the possibility forever, even that's what, you know, it's difficult to discuss what we're talking about in first Peter one, it's this group of people, their families were being ripped apart. They were being persecuted. There was suffering going on with all these trials. And part of this, uh, the dynamic of what he's sharing with is that we're involved in a living hope and a forever family, that's right. and these types of concepts. But I will be making some analogies as we discuss the new birth, because that seems to be my lane right now. I mean, you know, I mean, my granddaughter's only a year and a half old. We had the little one who's fixed to turn one, and now we have another little one. And so I'm seeing a lot of similarities on why Jesus and the the New Testament writers use this as really the illustration for what happens when a person surrenders to Jesus and, and reenacts the death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, now, at this point... I'll interject. Strangely enough, the guy who wrote this, at one point in his life, when Jesus was there on the earth and they're standing there talking, this is pre-death, burial and resurrection. And guess what this, this guy said? When he heard the news from the Savior of the world, we're going up to Jerusalem, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priest, teachers of the law. They'll hand me over. They'll mock me, spit on me, and they'll kill me. In three days, I'll rise from the dead. This guy said, that ain't going to happen. Yeah, he said, Ever. never. Never. That's yeah. not going to happen. So the very thing he's writing about throughout First First Peter, every time you look up, well, guess what he goes back to? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the gospel, you know, First, you know, sprinkling by his blood. Second, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil. Now, Peter, what are you talking about? Just a little bit earlier, you were saying that was not going to happen, which shows you that God is persistent. He's very loving. He's very, uh, well, what would you say? He he just lets it get, go by one ear and out the other. On God, he, Peter never realized He'd be writing about this. That's right. He Thirty was, years he later, was a, he was an anti-Jesus fellow. He right. he was standing around with him, but he was dictating policy on what he was going to do. And in this case, what he was going to do was save the world, including him. Right. Yeah, not pretty amazing. I think he experienced this idea of new birth Whew. on that on that on the shore of that sea. That's right. Whenever they were having that conversation, remember, and and he asked him three times if he loved him. That was his experience, and and that's when the shame dropped. Zach, you were talking earlier, and then from that point, but it forward, came down to the acts of crucifixion. Here's what Peter said, who turned out to be a great apostle. He he said, "I'm checking it to you. I have the, the whole bunch. I'm right. I'm getting out of here." That's right. And well, we we went we made the point. It shows people how the people need to be patient when you're working with them. That's right. And they're saying, ain't nobody going to tell me. You just have to be patient. It's because but I'm thinking are. about Peter. I said, it's one time Peter said, you're not going to die. They're being resurrected. Well, it was, a, it was about a 10-year uh, period um, historically from Acts 1 to, to Acts 10. There you go. Whenever Cornelius, that host, that was 10 years it went It's by. a good thing to look at when you're, when you're going to look at First Peter 
at his background and the cha- the tremendous change that happened right. to him and the trouble he had gone through and the mindset of it. He was a little belligerent yep. with the Savior of the world. So it really shows you the power of God and how persistent God is about saving people. Yeah, it teaches you patience. Let's take another break. All right, I got good news, Jace. Give it. Thanks to the support of our audience, Patriot Mobile has emerged as one of the leaders in the parallel economy, and they offer service with all three major networks now, which is great. That means if you're with one of the big three, uh, you like the service, but you hate their value, you can access them now with Patriot Mobile. They also offer a performance guarantee, and if you're not happy with your coverage, you can switch between the three major carriers for free. So that's big news. Uh, Patriot Mobile, as you know, is America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. They offer nationwide coverage on the best 4G and 5G networks. So you get the same great service. The difference is you support a company that supports the values that we love, our God-given rights and freedoms. So this new year, resolve to stop supporting companies that don't align with your values, but values that you believe in. They have a 100% U.S.-based customer service team that makes switching very easy. You go to patriotmobile.com slash Phil, or you can call them at 878-PATRIOT. Get free activation today with the offer code Phil. So that's patriotmobile.com slash Phil, or call them at 878-PATRIOT with free activation. Use the offer code Phil. All Well, I was going to say this, though. One thing that I don't think we emphasize enough is when when this illustration is used about the new birth, you would think that when God transformed you, it's, it would be greater than the illustration that he's given. He's just trying to get you to relate. But when you think about what happens from you as an infant to an adult, mm-hmm. think about the magnitude of that transformation. Yeah. Great point. And in this in your salvation, that's why he, you know, he starts off about the new birth. And then he says, you know, in chapter two, which we'll get to, you grow up in your salvation. That's what he says. You grow up in your salvation. And really, it's not to 21. The Jews had it right. It's till about 30 before right. you really fully start to understand what's You got to remember what Peter, think about it. Peter fell victim to it. But fortunately for him, he, he had a change of heart. They stumble. You say, well, how, how come people don't come to Jesus? It's more of them. Uh, you're like living stones, God and precious. And you also like living or being built into a spiritual house. But you know what Peter said? He said that, you know why they stumble? Because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. At one point in his life, Al, this man disobeyed the message. Jesus told him what was going to happen. He said, it ain't going to happen. He's standing there arguing. Yeah, but he did it. But and I think it's a good lesson for us. It wasn't that Peter didn't know Jesus. Great lesson he wasn't for us. around Jesus. It, you know, most time we think people that you know are outside of Jesus are so far away. Well, look, he was there. His problem was, if you remember, we didn't really get into this in depthly in Mark fourteen. But when Jesus said that you're all gonna, you're all gonna fall away. That was a uh, fourteen twenty seven. Well, Peter said, well, let me just tell you something. Yeah. If all fall away, yeah. I will not. Now, yeah. now that sounds fantastic. But when you think about it, he number one, he's saying he's better than everybody else. And two, he's claiming not this is nothing to do with Jesus. This is all about him. He's like, I'm so strong and and so uh you know, tough that I'm not falling away and I'm better than this, which is you think about. And I bet you the other apostles, the other disciples believe that. Well, when you take Jesus and his grace and, and I mean his grace and the power of his resurrection out of religion, well, what are you left with? A, A bunch of rules and regulations and, and claims that you're, you know, you're comparing yourself to other people, which is what a lot of religions, unfortunately, is all about. As long as you're better than most morally or intellectually, you'll you'll probably be pretty good. 
And so that's what he said, because then he reiterated and said, because Jesus, I mean, what's Jesus going to say? Oh, you're right, Peter. I was, you know. No, he's like, no, I'm telling you, you're, you're going to deny me before the rooster crows twice. But Peter insisted emphatically. I mean, now he's, now he's brought his, his moral religious view with passion. And at one point in his life, this, the point we're talking about that Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are talking about, at that point, oh, he was anti-Jesus. Yeah, that's you're right. not going to die and save well, the world. Right, exactly. I mean, it's what hard to I think the thing that he did, the thing Peter didn't get, and the reason why he was afraid, and and because he, he that's what he, he was afraid. We know that later because that's why he denied him. You know, whenever he saw that he got arrested, so in G, G, he didn't have a concept of the resurrection. So the same, the reason why he was rebuking him for for proclaiming a death was because Peter didn't have a concept of a resurrection. That's and right. so that's why I don't think it's an accident that when you read about this heavenly inheritance here in, in 1 Peter 1, 3, what does he anchor the whole thing in? The resurrection. Because he got it. Once he saw the resurrected Lord, it was like, oh, okay. It, something clicked in he him. Had a big and that's change what, of heart. But yep. he had to. My point was that when you tied in with the new birth, look, one thing we can talk about, you know, all the verses where Jesus said change and become like a little child. We can use this illustration and we think about it. One thing's for sure. When you are an infant, when you're newly born, you are 100% dependent on someone else. And I think when you see Peter's attitude here, that's what had to change. He was still saying, oh, I'll never, if I have to, this next day was, what well, if I have to die with you? And I believe he really thought that. He, but he was basic. This is all about he, what he's going to do and what he can do and what he will do. And I'm, but when you're in Christ, there's, you realize, you know, outside of Christ, that's the one realization you have to have to come to grips with. Sometimes that, that you can't do this. Sometimes, in fact, at all times, you have to give people time. I had a guy, I've mentioned it before. He said, so you're telling me I'm going to die. I said, just like everybody else has. He said, he jumped up on his feet. He said, nobody's going to tell me I'm going to die. I said, dude, you might as well just just understand something. Physical death's a problem. I've explained to you how God has solved that problem through Jesus and the resurrection. You're going to die. So this is your ticket out of here. We argued. He left in a huff. He was dead in less than two months got knifed to death in a bar two months later. I tried to tell him. I, I begged him. He, he, he was at the point where he said no. Peter was at a, at a point where he said, that's never going to happen. That's right. Your, your death for the sins of the world. He said, oh, yeah, it's going to happen. He said, get, get behind me, Satan, because he, he knew that's the way the evil one talks. Right. So we have to give people time to digest, ingest, whatever, the yeah, gospel, but at some the point they have to conclude that they're going to have to die and surrender their will, and that's what he was having trouble doing. So, so when I study with people, I'm thinking, is God going to going to save this guy or what? So, but all I can do is just tell him it's not like rocket science. You know, it's an event that happened in time, and I got the person who did it, and they're saying, "Oh well, I don't get that Bible in my face." I said, "Man, it's your ticket out of here." That's why it's the brilliance of the the new birth, which takes Ooh. us back to that. Let's take another break. I think that's why Peter can make it so strikingly clear. Right. Because he's been there and no, done I that. I agree 100%. Well, so so well, by way of review, <clears throat> let Zach, me go back. I think Zach was going to say. Oh, go ahead, Zach. Did you have something you were going to say? Well, I was just going to point out, back to the living hope, I think that that – how often have we have we not only heard, but I mean, even preached uh, the gospel of death, which is part of it, right? That uh, we we die to ourselves, and and even a new birth, we're born again. But I think in this concept of resurrection is not limited to just us being raised, you know, out of the water, for example, in baptism, you know, or raised up to live a new life. Romans chapter six. You read the whole concept of, uh, in, in context of Romans six. 
it's it's a it's an ongoing thing so that we may live a new life you know or you're raised with Christ for for a purpose so that you may live a new life that is ongoing and it's a progressive healing it's what um, you just mentioned a while ago that it's you got to grow up and what he's getting to in chapter two but even in chapter one I mean he starts talking a whole lot about holy living about being prepared in the sobriety of your mind you know, not being conformed to the world, but being formed by by the Spirit and 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 by Christ, and so you, you see this idea that it's not just hey, let's get saved, let's get right, let's get our ticket out of here, and then that's that, that's not the ultimate point of it. The ultimate point is to be transformed into the image of of Christ, and and th- that we can jo- dwell with Him. So I I think that's a whole lot of what this living hope is about is that it's not it's not just us looking back on our birth, like, like you just witnessed a birth. And that was great because you have a, a grandchild now that that's going to grow up in your, in your home and, and in your life. But, but it, it, what, there's a whole lot more that's going to happen post birth. At one that time, are be memories. And it, yeah. At one time, Peter was like a lot of others, always be prepared. He said to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give it, to give the reason for the hope that you have. So, he, when he finally started writing down where his path had been and where it ended up, he said, "Look, just be prepared to give an answer. Why do you follow Jesus? What, 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 what's this all about?" And then you know, then the, here comes the resurrection of the dead and the forgiveness of sins. And uh, what a message! He, by the way, he does cover the new birth over in First Peter three, so he even taps in on that. Well, I just want to make the point. Go ahead now. Yeah, because I, 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 I'm sticking a stake in the ground here. I'm saying there's he discusses faith, hope, and love in this first chapter. You know, we haven't really drawn attention to that, but it, it's not noticeable because it's really a theme in all the New Testament letters. But what I'm going to present to you for consideration is that's the only place, <clears throat> the new birth, <clears throat> The only place you're going to find this trust, this living hope, and this sincere love is in Christ, in in that position. Because, you know, he doesn't go into all the things that you're supposed to do. He, He just generically talks about the living hope. I mean, the new birth that comes from the living hope, and he discusses uh, Jesus being sacrificed in de- detail in this first chapter uh, and, the, and the resurrection. But my point is, what's the difference in, uh, you know, the Pharisees and even Peter in that moment of he was passionately, I think he was sincere. He just didn't understand that this is God's plan. It, it's not about your response and reaction to this. It's about his plan, not yours. Because, I mean, it, you had a battle of plans, which individually and in real life, that's the way we all are. It's like we want Jesus, uh, you know, to follow us. It's basically the deal. Instead of us following Jesus, that, that was really what it came down to, just to simplify all this. Because I want to make the point that a lot of these religious leaders and a lot of these Pharisees, they had all these, they were, they were good moral people. I mean, now we know some of them, we're probably hypocritical and all, but the bottom line is when you think about what, what he's expressing here, this is not like you understanding that there is a God, and, and the illustration I heard that I like is like piling up bricks. You know, you could work all day, and you pile up bricks, and you pile up bricks, and you pile up bricks, but at the end of the day, these bricks are dead, or, or you could be piling up gold, or because that's the comparison he's making. This is a living organism likened to you, something being planted and growing, becoming completely new and life giving because of the Holy spirit that, that would enter and not based on anything that we can, we can do. I mean, you could dig a hole all day and what you got, you got, you got a big hole. This is about something being planted in us and starts to grow. And it's more enormous than the transformation is more enormous than from a toddler or I mean, an infant turning into an adult. It's called imperishable seed. That's where I was going with that. So all the things that are perishable, I'm just saying you could, you could lay out all the things you've done, all the work. People ha- Look, people have worked in the name of the Lord their entire life and never realized that it wasn't about them. 
Yep. At the end, they just got a giant pile of bricks. Yep. Yep. They did a lot of work. Well, what's that going to do? It, yep. it's, there, it's, you have a big pile of rubble. They still have sins, and they're going to die. Exactly. Well, you go down in some Mexican jungle, and you see these grand structures of these people, these Mayans, and all these people that built these amazing things, and it's just they're just out there in the middle of a jungle, and there's nobody there it's, it, for us to look at. So by way of reset, I, I wanted I didn't give you a chance to give you my outline last time, these first like verses 1, 3 through 9. And so I want to give you this outline and get us back to 10, sort of reset to get us back into the text. But we obviously we've been talking about living hope, which is verse three, which the living hope is Jesus and his resurrection. Right. The, and then in verse four, in my outline, I call it an incorruptible inheritance because it's in heaven. Right. That's where Jesus is. And we read Hebrews six. He's anchored in heaven. It says it's kept there. For us, and so we read it first Thessalonians four, first John two. We understand that he's going to come back from heaven to get us, right? So our inheritance is there. When he says it's time to come, he's coming. In verse five, he says we have an impenetrable defense. In other words, since it's there, it's shielded. Satan can't take that away from us because it's in heaven in Jesus. So our faith is is what matters. And Jace, to your point a minute ago, you remember in Luke twelve. Whenever Jesus told the parable about the fool with the bigger barns, if you're only looking to this life instead of what's coming next, I mean, that's the biggest, the most foolish thing you could do, right? And he says, this guy's building all these bigger barns when what matters is what's kept in heaven. Yeah. In verses six and seven is what I call an improving faith because he talks about your faith improves because it's refined and it's refined when it's tested. And testing comes by fire, and that becomes difficulty, right? We talked about that. And then verse 8 is what I call the invisible Savior, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, that's seeing the unseen. That's understanding who Jesus is, even though physically we don't look at him. <clears throat> and he said in John chapter 20, Blessed are you who've seen me, but blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. And then in verse 9, he says you have an immediate salvation. You are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. That's happening in real time yep. as we live here. So that sets us up for what I call the legacy. And Jess, you read this text last time, but I want to read it again to set up where we're going to wind up in verse 13, because we want to talk about that just a little bit more about this idea that it was looked at all the way through time. But let's take a, our last break. So verse 10 says, concerning the salvation that we've been talking about, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them, this is back in the prophets in the Old Testament, was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So that's both. At the time, Peter could have thrown in there. Uh, I missed it. <laughs> he did. Before I knew better. <laughs> Along with a lot of others, right? You bet you. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even yeah, he gets it now. Even angels long to look into these things. Yep. And so, you know, what he's saying is that he's going to go into this quite a bit more in Second Peter chapter 1. Yep. When he talks about, you know. After he kind of lays the groundwork in First Peter 1. Exactly. That, that, First the Peter. Spirit, that these men were carried along by the Holy Spirit yep. to bring out this idea of, of, of the gospel that's always been pointed to in the Old Testament. Well, but, the problem, though, is because, look, I read all these scholars and people, you know, commenting on what we're fixed to read and i was really disappointed i was really disappointed and that some old commercial fisherman wrote this no i was disappointed in some of the scholars views of what some of this means and and what i mean is as we go on through here you're going to read a verse that says you know be holy just as i am holy like in uh, first peter 1 15 and because when you just look at that at face value well, if you're being honest with yourself, your first conclusion should be, well, I'm never going to be able to pull that off, which is 
a good response because there's one who's holy and I'm not him. And the point I'm getting at is when you go down to verse, uh, when it says verse 22, so now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have this sincere love, which is, you know, that three parts that you get out of the new birth, the faith, which he addressed in verse five of chapter one and the hope, which he said in verse three, you see this faith, hope and love working. Well, people all of a sudden jump to the truth being the entire Bible. And now they're looking at, well, you've got to be holy like God. And, you know, the Sermon on the Mount comes into, into, into mind when he says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So all of a sudden, people then, the reason I was disappointed with the scholars is because then they were trying to figure out how to obey the entire Bible. How, how am I? I mean, because that's what it says. What, what am I supposed to do? And, and so just the stuff I read, I, I, I was like, they can't figure this out. Th th this is about revealing a person. This is a belonging. There's a, there's a difference in doing something because you have to you know, here are the rules. Tell me what I need to do. Because you know what we do if we just have to do it that way? You do the least amount. Let's say if this was like a college course where you had to study and try to get all the right answers. Well, what do you do in college? You do the least amount that it takes to pass. You're not putting anything extra. But when you realize this is a relationship, then all of a sudden, and it's a relationship, that he initiated by taking care of our sins and giving us away out of the ground. I mean, this is all dependent on him. All of a sudden, you're not just doing what you necessarily have to. You want to do. You want to go over and beyond because of your motivation out of from his grace. And your faith assures you that you already have it. Therefore, which act is like the, it. which which is which <laughs> is the. I think that's that's a. Big, big point, and I think a huge misconception, maybe the biggest misconception and paradigm shift that we struggle with in the church is understanding what you just said. That, And, and we grew up particularly in a church that had a the way we interpreted the Bible. You, you guys probably remember this. The way we were taught to interpret the Bible was just what you said. It was command, example, and necessary inference. And so it was essentially, when and we would read phrases like obey the gospel, we thought that meant obey the Bible. So we're we're, we're, we've, we're interpreting the are interpreting the Bible as a legal document of how to be good, and that's yeah, not exactly. what it is. Yeah, I it's remember a, the first time I heard that phrase, Zach. I I went and looked where that was because they said, you know, you got to follow the commands, the examples, and the necessary inferences. And I thought, well, where did they get that? And I searched the entire Bible, and I was like. I can't find necessary inference anywhere in here. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I well, literally it's, thought it's, that was well, a Bible we, verse. <laughs> well, you you jokingly uh, said something about legalism at the beginning, but we but the but the beginning of the podcast. That's what we came out of because we had, we were not reading the Bible through the lens of of a revelation about a person. When you think about um, this idea of obtaining um, the outcome of our faith the salvation of your souls, which is in verse eight. And you think about, I, I thought about when I, when you mentioned that earlier, I think your translation is a little different than mine, but I, I was like, well, what is the, what is the outcome? And the outcome of our salvation is John 17, three, it's eternal life defined as knowing a person, knowing the one true God. And then the our incarnation of that God at Jesus Christ, his son, whom he sent. I mean, I repeat this all the time, but it's so true and so like, – if you want transformation, you're not going to get it because you know all the right things because you cognitively got it. I, I know I know for a fact that if I load up with carbs, that I'm going to be overweight. I know that. And guess what I had for lunch? I had two biscuits from Popeye's. It's not that <laughs> – the problem, is, the problem is, not, is that I don't – it's not about knowledge. It's about desire and I do what I want. And the goal of the gospel being transformed into the image of Christ, it is a what it means is is you are progressively uh, what you desire will progressively be what He desires, and that's what Dallas Willard calls the only true form of human freedom. Because then you can do whatever you want in Christ, because you'll want what Christ wants. So that's the goal is to is to shape what you desire. 
through. And, yeah. and so all these works that we do, that, that's the goal. It's not to gain anything yeah. from God. It just I mean, shapes I mean, us into his image. Which, to uh, Jason's point, the, pro- the purpose of all the prophecy, of all the history, of all the stories, of all the law, of everything we read about, of all the Bible, is to introduce us to Jesus. Exactly. That's the purpose and, of all of it, I which, mean, is, which is Peter's point. I mean, I hijacked your outline just because I, I was so disturbed by reading this. And to answer the scenario I put forth, you, you realize that your holiness is only going to come from God's holiness. Your your purification, yeah. it, it came because he was pure and sacrificed himself in your place. So, so when it says, now that I've purified myself from obeying the truth— well, Jesus is the truth. Remember when he said, I am the truth? And so people said, oh, well, wait a minute now. They're trying to interject the entire Bible in that. And I keep going back to John 5, which I constantly do, when he said, look, you're studying these scriptures, thinking that by them you'll possess eternal life, but you refuse to come to me, who the scriptures were pointing to. I added that part. but And you yet you refuse to believe in me. It's just people have a hard time acknowledging that God became a man and came down to earth, even though they know the scriptures, the very thing they're defending says that over and over. And it's what Peter's point is here. Well, that's so true. This is how it plays out. Uh, I've seen this three times this week about a particular subject. I'm going to say it uh, and I'm not making a stance on it. I'm just making it. I'm just going to say it. (laughs) Just say it, Zach. Say it. it, Come on. I I get it. I get a text and it's basically like, you know, we're going to this church and blah, blah, blah. It's all, all, they want to know what, you know, what do I believe about predestination and all this stuff? And I said, here, I said, let me tell you something, two things. One, you can't, I I can't not believe in predestination because it's in the Bible. Now, if you're asking me what I think it means, (laughs) that's a different question. But I said, let me tell you something. And I I, I sent them a quote from A.W. Tozier who's someone that I like a lot. And he said this um, to his, his, I think his nephew who was going to seminary. And he said, look, he, this is the, this is the warning that he gave him. He said, when you go to seminary, he said, all the boys are going to stay up till two or three in the morning. And they're going to be debating. The Armenians are going to debate the Calvinist on, on predestination and all of that and election. He said, but you, my son, he said, you go into your dorm room and you pray and pursue God. And at the end of four years, you'll know God. And I thought, man, like, why are we wasting our time? We're wait- I'm not saying that these things don't matter. And I study deeply into all these issues. But, man, if I'm missing the person of who God is, and this is in every denomination, every church, we all struggle with this. We want to replace God with a system. We want to replace God with a – we want to tidy it up. And I want to give me my formula. That I don't have to think about it. I don't want to wrestle with things. I want to, I want to have this confidence. I'm like, you know what? Now, your confidence is in knowing him. And yeah. none of that knowledge is going to replace – uh, an intimate well, knowledge and, and a relational knowledge of knowing knowing this person who who we call Jesus. Well, to your point, how many you know newborn babies are in the uh, the daycare or whatever we want to call it, arguing about anything? <laughs> <laughs> they're just trying to just trying to. They're just like feed me, eat, love me. They're just trying help to, me. They're just trying to me. eat and poop and, <laughs> and move on. What, what happens is this: when you know God, when you get close to Jesus. And you spend time with him. Here's what happens. You realize you don't know a whole lot. And there's a humility that comes with that. When you compare yourself to the supremacy, the sovereignty, the power, and the goodness of a holy God who incarnated in a man named Jesus. Peter was an ordinary, unschooled man. I'll give you a cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. So I will reveal an argument that Zach and I have been having for about three weeks uh, concerning legalism. Mm -hmm. And, but we'll do it in the after hours. That way, over to only offend <laughs> as safer. few people as possible. There you go. There's your cliffhanger for overtime. If you want to follow us over, it's blazetv.com slash unashamed or overtime. Next podcast, we'll get to First Peter 1, 13. But if you want to follow us to overtime, we'll reveal Chase's and Zach's big argument. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.